So in this week, we'll be talking about um, World War II and the origins of the Cold War. And for this lecture, we'll be beginning exactly where last lecture uh, ended, which was pretty much in the 1930s um, when we realized that both Hoover's and FDR's responses to the Great, Great Depression uh, ultimately did not dig us out of the, out of the Great Depression, that um, it wasn't until World War II, America's entrance into World War II, um, that economic recovery was finally possible. And once the economy started to rebound, um, this is when we see a fundamental transformation in this conception and, and the experience of citizenship. And this is really encapsulated in a speech that FDR gives, again, by radio announcement, um, called The Four Freedoms, where he outlines these four essential human freedoms that he feels are under attack, right, uh, in World War II. Um, and these are freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom of want, and freedom of fear. And these are four freedoms entailed in democratic countries, as opposed to fascist countries who are really threatening these four, fr four freedoms in very distinct ways. So in this radio address, FDR essentially outlines these four freedoms as uh, universal human values that America must fight to protect, okay? So in his radio address, he declares that these four freedoms embodied the rights of every creed, every race, everywhere they lived, and made clear the crucial difference between ourselves, these democratic countries who embody these freedoms, um, and the fascist countries who are threatening these freedoms. Um, and so these are the uh, parameters um, by which we're gonna talk about the transformation of, of citizenship in America um, during World War II. Okay, but to do that, we need to outline who is actually threatening these freedoms. So uh, the Great Depression didn't only rattle American economy and society. We talked about how it kind of rever reverberated around the world. So the Great Depression shocked the world, right? Um, and certain governments collapsed and uh, certain governments maintained their, their control. Um, but in that process, uh, very different governments were um, experimenting with new ideas of governance and different styles of political ideology. Um, and fascism becomes very, very popular, especially those in those countries that are hardest hit by economic devastation. And three nations in particular emerge with the willingness to use military force to achieve their goals. But the fascist countries we'll be talking about first are Italy and Germany. Um, and then we'll be talking a little bit more about um, the Japanese empire um, that aligns themselves with uh, Italy and Germany. But to begin with that, we need to talk about what fascism, fascism is. So fascism entails the, uh, the individual subordination uh, to the state as a means of enhancing national power. And what that means is basically um, citizens, uh, the rights of citizens are really secondary in, in a fascist, fascist dictatorship the rights of citizens are secondary to the, um, the empowerment of the state, right? So, it's, so, so the rights of citizens are really taking a back seat, right? Uh, and the state is willing to repress the rights of citizens so, as long, long, so long as the state is able to uh, continue to grow more powerful, more powerful and more um, affluent. Okay, so number one, subordination of citizens enables the state to, th to thrive. Number two, um, it also, in, in a fascist dictatorship, they also discourage individual competition, right? As, because uh, accordingly, uh, individual competition tears the society apart. So discouraging competition is a way of bringing people together, right? Fascism also entails a quote unquote, benevolent authoritarianism um, in which uh, fascist states rule over people, but do so ethically insofar as the state's repression keeps the entire body of the nation uh, unified and vigorous uh, towards whatever kind of economic or, or uh, goals that that fascist country has, okay? And this third part is very, very, very important um, because it really targets the way in which fascist countries threaten um, the four freedoms that FDR is talking about. So fascism supports the conception of natural inequality, right? Okay, so A, individuals are not equal by birth, but should not, and should not be equal under law. 
So fascism really um, enhances inequality in many ways um, because individuals are divided uh, by their natural abilities and social worth, right? So um, an in, a citizen that can produce more for the state um, in a fascist state um, is worth more, right? And their rights are worth more, okay? So according to fa this, this kind of ideology, fascism uh, divides societies um, along naturally, quote unquote, inferior and naturally superior groups um, and enhances the superior groups as a way of enhancing overall state power. And that's really important because um, right off the bat, that, that, that contradicts the, the four freedoms that FDR is talking about. So there are two countries in Central Europe that really um, capitalize um, and really bring fascism uh, on a global stage. And these are Italy and Germany. So Italy, uh, Benito Mussolini declares himself the dictator of, of Italy, fascist dictator in 1921, um, and then proceeds to expand the country's value and assets by essentially double down, double, doubling down on the um, coloni colon uh, colonialism that we saw in the, in the early uh, first two decades of 20th century. So in 1935, he invades Ethiopia um, and expands uh, the Italian empire into North Africa. Okay, and the same, the same thing is gonna happen with, with Germany. In 1933, Adolf Hitler um, is elected through the Nazi party, he's a political party, right? Uh, but elects, is elected through the Nazi party as German chancellor, okay? Um, and again, we're gonna see how certain people's rights are immediately suppressed and certain people's rights, uh, other people's rights are really enhanced in this way. So in Nazi Germany, um, Nazism is a kind of, is, is directly is implicated with anti-Semitism. And so when we talked about the way in which uh, fascist societies enhance the rights of superior people, right, that can really support the state, um, and repress the rights of quote unquote inferior people that you know don't really can't really or doesn't seem like they can really pr contribute to the state. Um, in Nazi Germany, um, ethnic minorities, particularly Jews in Germany, are deemed inferior, right? And so, um, according to fascist ideology, they don't deserve the rights um, that superior people. Um, or quote unquote superior people have because they're not contributing to the, to the national uh, power as much as uh, superior people. So not, Nazi Germany entailed the state-sponsored persecution of Jews. Um, and this meant that synagogues, Jewish businesses and homes were looted and destroyed systematically. Um, but it even went so far as the, the creation of concentration centers that, that confined nearly 100,000 Jewish people. Um, and all, all throughout, uh, Germany, but as Germany expands, these concentration uh, centers are created throughout Central Europe, throughout the German Empire, um, and contributes to this uh, genocide that ensues throughout Central Europe, through the, the German Empire. Okay, so immediately, this is uh, exactly the kind of uh, repression of human rights that um, the FDR is, is discussing in his Four Freedom Speech in 1941. And it's one of the reasons why he declares war or the United States declares war um, on Germany, but also Italy and ultimately uh, Japan when Japan al al aligns itself with Italy and Germany. And this state-sponsored anti-Semitism really engenders a huge wave of immigration of Jews um, and other ethnic minorities uh, from Central Europe to the United States between 1933 and 1938, about 60,000 uh, Jewish refugees entered the United States. Um, and this immigration wave really transforms American society. And I have a picture here of, of let me see if I can move my image, picture here of uh, three or actually four notable Jewish refugees. Uh, the person immediately to my right here, um, you may know Albert Einstein, uh, ultimately transforms American academia um, and contributes to the development of nuclear fission, which is um, critical in developing nuclear power. Um, the next image to the right of Albert Einstein may know, may, may know this artist, um, uh, Rothko, 
who comes to America, settles in New York City, and ultimately transforms um, Amer American fine arts, you know, in a huge way with a huge following. Um, below Albert Einstein, some of you may know this person. Um, if you don't, you really should. This is Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger has a really strange and, and uh, interesting life. So he's a German Jew who immigrates to the United States in the 1930s, in the early 1930s. Um, he settles in, his family settles in New York City. Um, he goes to CUNY, ultimately goes to graduate school, gets a PhD in political science at Harvard, um, becomes a preeminent uh, American academic, um, writing several books on foreign policy specifically. Um, then he enlists in the American in the U.S. Army uh, during World War II in the 1940s. Um, ultimately, fight goes back to Germany to fight um, to fight the Nazis in that in, in the European theater. Um, in a way, you could kind of think of him as a, as a, as a weird and, and twisted storyline, kind of like the the, the strange storyline of Robert Smalls. Of course, in a very different way. After World War One. Kissinger comes back to the United States, continues his jobs as a Harvard professor teaching political science, and particularly uh, um, an expert in American foreign policy. And he becomes also a government advisor as well, a government advisor in foreign policy. He serves in um, pretty much every single presidential administration as a foreign policy advisor from Richard Nixon in the late 1960s all the way up until the present uh, uh, United States president. He serves as American foreign policy advisor and ultimately shapes American foreign policy through the rest of the 20th century uh, after World War II and even into the 21st century, still alive today. Um, and then finally, uh, next, Henry Kissinger, Hannah Arendt, another political theorist, uh, however more uh, theoretical than uh, the foreign policy uh, kind of ideas that Henry Kissinger is known for. So these four immigrants represent the way in which um, Jewish refugees in America from Europe really transform many different aspects of American society after World War II. Germany really expands along the same lines that Italy expands its empire. Okay, So in 1936, Germany invades the Rhineland. What is the Rhineland? Rhineland is essentially this um, this ancient land along the Rhine River where historically German speaking and ethnic, ethnic Germans lived for centuries and centuries. Um, and, this is, and this is Hitler's claim to this area. So he invades the Rhineland, expanding German boundaries, um, and thereby violating the Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I, in which, if you remember, um, it placed harsh economic uh, restrictions, but also prohibited Germany from uh, having an army uh, and from having uh, armed policemen. This is really val invalidating this Treaty of Versailles um, and really should have been uh, the starting point of World War II. Um, but it wasn't until Germany invades Poland in 1939 that Britain, France, um, and other Central European powers um, ultimately declare war on Germany because they're violating all of these sanctions and all these policies that were put in place after World War I to um, restrict the mobility and restrict the power that, that Germany could um, uh, uh, culminate you know, through the military industrial complex in Germany. Okay? Um, and the reason why many Central European po powers did not immediately take up arms against Germany is because Germany uh, was very closely aligned with uh, the communist uh, Russia, particularly Stalin. So uh, many Central European powers, and, and indeed America was very hesitant in, in, in combating Germany, just because, well, we'll, we'll get in the case with, with uh, United States in particular, but, but primarily because um, it had such a big backing, right? So in the way that, that Italy was expanding its empire in North, America, uh, North Africa, Germany was also expanding its empire, however, in, mostly in Central Europe. Okay. Um, ultimately, in 1941, Germany turns on its Soviet allies um, and um, subsequently initiates a war um, on two battle, battle fronts, on the Eastern Front um, with Soviet Russia um, and on the Western Front combating uh, France and ultimately England. Um, the German Empire stretches all the way to the western western coast of, of Europe, 
Um, and they make, they make very detailed plans to invade England. However, they were unsuccessful. Um, but while they are unsuccessful in invading England, they nonetheless conduct extensive and um, really detrimental bombing campaigns um, of London in particular. So this next slide is a um, map of this giant, of, of the extent of um, Germany's expansion during the 1930s up into 19, early 1940s. So you can see uh, the Rhineland is here. Um, you can see the Rhineland, I guess, to the west of, of the, uh, well, it's clearly marked there. Um, and it's really abutting uh, France, the Netherlands, and Belgium, which they subsequently uh, invade um, in the 19, late 1930s. Um, but you can see the way in which uh, Germany is expanding from its World War I uh, borders uh, throughout this time. And then we get to J Japan, okay? The thing about Japan is that um, they're an island, right? So, or a, a series of islands, um, and they're very small, okay? So Japan's economy is really rested, um, is really dependent on international commerce. So the only way that Japan is gonna, you know, um, enhance their economy and, and nationalistic power is by essentially dominating those around them. So, um, with the collapse of world trade in, in, in the Great Depression, many Japanese nationalists um, sought other means uh, to ensure economic vitality because uh, international commerce was kind of collapsed during the 1930s. So they essentially mil uh, used their military to dominate um, the, the outlying areas around Japan, specifically in Manchuria. They invade in 1931. They subsequently start to invade um, uh, Korea and parts of China as well. Um, using Chinese labor um, specifically as a kind of slave labor to um, galvanize their their economy and to um, really increase their colonial possessions in the South Pacific. Um, so Manchuria is definitely rich in iron, rich in, rich in coal, and ultimately accounts for 95% of Japanese over, over overseas investments. And so Manchuria is this direct colony that, that, uh, that Japan acquires um, and ultimately uses the, um, the power it, it gains from Manchuria to start dominating other parts of, of the world um, in this way. So in 1940, Japan signs a defense treaty with Germany and, and Italy, um, essentially aligning uh, Japan, Germany, and Italy um, an alliance known as the Axis powers, which um, democratic countries see as an immediate threat to those four uh, human freedoms that FDR outlines in that, that four freedom speech in 1941. So America's response to the development of this Axis powers um, was kind of like the same response that we saw in World War I, and that's immediately neutra new neutrality. So most Americans were very ambival ambivalent about going to war again, um, just because of the, the, um, the amount of devastation that took place during World War I, right? Remember the Bonus Army, right? So that was uh, 1932, not 10 years, you know, um, not, not, so not, not too long before uh, America ultimately enters again. So that, that was the forefront of Americans' mind. They, they realized that um, the implications of global war were very drastic and they were, they were equivalent of getting back into it. So American, Amer most Americans did not want to go back to war. Um, also, there were strong economic ties to those Axis powers. For example, Henry Ford um, conducted extensive business with Nazi Germany had close political relationships with Adolf Hitler and many of the high ranking officers in the German government. Um, Henry Ford also had many manufacturing plants in Nazi Germany where um, those manufacturing plants employed Jewish slave labor provided by the German government. So for America to get in a war with Nazi Germany would mean sacrificing the economic capital that it was um, contributing through the, um, through Jewish, Jewish slave labor. Also with Japan, Japan also had um, close economic ties to the United States um, and Americans supplied trucks, um, aircraft and other um, military um, 
supplies, uh, but most of all oil, right? So until, until we got in a war with Japan, America was supplying 80% of Japanese oil, right? And this is the oil, keep in mind, that Japan was using to fuel its colonial expansion um, and subsequent domination of parts of China, uh, Manchuria, and Korea. So Americans were deeply implicated in the repression of human rights, even though you know, it became a rallying cry for FDR uh, for us to get into, in, involved in World War I. At the, at the outset, we were deeply implicated in the repression of human rights. Right, so uh, the American response was neutral just because of the economic ties that we maintained with many of the Axis powers. However, over time, that, that response of neutrality ultimately um, uh, eroded and we, were, we, we entered World War I, uh, World War II, uh, for reasons we'll get into in just a moment. By the end of the 1930s, American neutrality gave way to what was called a policy, foreign policy of limited engagement. Okay. And that basically meant that America was willing to support um, the democratic countries, particularly uh, England, um, by giving money, supplies, and military aid. However, it was not willing to um, issue troops, right, or, or to commit troops to this combat. Uh, not yet, at least, right? And what this looked like was uh, a kind of uh, um, policy was known in 1941 called the Lend-Lease Act. Um, where basically America was willing to um, give any country um, whose security was vital to U.S. interests, give them um, arms and equipment, but not troops yet, not troops. So this entailed the sale, transfer, and transfer and lease of um, weapons um, and supplies to those democratic countries who were threatened by the Axis powers. And that's really important. Um, and, and it ultimately led to America's direct involvement in World War II. So by 1940, not well, early 1940, um, America was directly supporting um, uh, England, China, and the Soviet Union um, in, in the, those aspects we mentioned, um, economic um, stimulus and, and, and support, um, but also in, in lending and leasing the material supplies that those countries would need in fighting um, the, the, the Italians, the, the Germans, and the Japanese. But also another, another important thing happens in 1940 is that FDR freezes all Japanese assets in the United States, halting virtually all trade between the United States and Japan, um, including the sale of oil that was so vital to the uh, Japanese at this point, right? And so Japan was in this position now that it needed to attack and conquer um, in order to survive. And that's really, really important because it leads directly to American involvement in, the, um, in, in, World, War, um, in World War II. So basically what happens in late November is that US, diplomatic, US and Japan, Japanese diplomatic relationships break down, right? And any, any time that two countries, their diplomatic relationships break down, that's just one step before ultimate war. So keep that in mind in terms of foreign policy throughout the 20th century. Um, by, by, by November 19, 19, um, 1940, Japan dispatches their fleet, um, this huge fleet in, in what was considered you know, a kamikaze mission in which the, the, the Japanese fleet only had so much oil to get to Hawaii. Um, and the mission was to uh, capture Hawaii or and capture in the outlying areas, particularly the American colonies like the Philippines, um, Malay, um, and the Dutch East Indi Indies um, and Guam, um, as a way of capturing necessary supplies, particularly oil, in perpetuating the further expansion of the Japanese Empire. So in November, Jap Japan uh, dispatches this this fleet in what was considered a one-way mission. They were there, they were really going to conquer these territories um, and then keep going or die trying. Okay, so um, the biggest naval U.S. naval installation in South Pacific during this time, um, and it remains one of the biggest uh, naval U.S. naval uh, na naval uh, installations in the world today, um, was in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. So November, November 26, 1940, Japan dispatches the fleet to Hawaii specifically, right? Um, and issues the surprise attack 
on the Hawaii's naval installations there. It destroys um, nearly 200 American aircraft um, and almost 30,000 American troops. Um, and this is really the moment, the turning point um, of Americans Amer America's isolationism, which uh, Roosevelt directly appeals to Congress for a declaration of war. Um, and it's directly after the uh, Pearl Harbor bombing that FDR actually um, gives his four freedom speech, which was so pivotal um, in terms of America's involvement in World War II. So by 1941, America declares war on the Japanese empire, but because Japan is also aligned with fascist uh, Italy and Germany, um, we also go to war with those countries as well, which is very, very important. So immediately what happens in the United States um, is a repression of Japanese American uh, civil liberties, which was hugely important. Executive Order 9066 is a game changer. Um, and it's kind of like what we saw during World War I with the repression of different political ideologies to, to, through the FBI. Um, and the FBI is going to play also a critical role in suppressing um, the rights of citizens, particularly those that uh, are, are deemed to be associated with the Axis powers. Um, and that means particularly immigrants from uh, those countries, right? So this is really important. So Executive Order 9066 um, is this uh, federal directive from the president, from FDR, which essentially authorizes the removal and the quarantine of hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children um, who, um, whose families are in Japan, right? So it's this military precaution protecting American military installations on the West Coast by quarantining people of Japanese descent because it's suspected that they could be uh, spies for the Japanese in this time. So by 1942, nearly 125 thousand um, Japanese Americans are quarantined this way in these construct uh, these concentration camps that the US government creates um, and I, I provided a small visual of what those concentration camps look like so um, during this time during during the you know America's initial involvement in World War uh, II um, Japanese businesses are discriminated against um, many families lose their financial assets um, when they when they relocated these concentration camps, and ultimately there is um, a huge wave of anti-Japanese resentment, you know, especially after um, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, um, and in this way it really transforms the relationship of Japanese Americans to the government in the way in which the government is suppressing their civil liberties um, and invalidating, indeed. Um, those four freedoms, those four universal freedoms that uh, FDR talks about as one of the motivations to get involved with World War II. And these Japanese Americans remain in quarantine for the duration of the war. Um, and it represents one of those moments when America have, has, you know, repressed civil liberties of its citizens um, as a way of advancing its priorities in this way. Um, and America's involvement in World War II really provides the full employment and full recovery from the Great Depression um, because it really energizes the, the corporations and the manufacturing in, industries that um, had long been dormant during the Great Depression, but um, now with the sole motive of providing uh, supplies and material for the war effort, um, they're now supported in a huge way by, by government contracts um, and defense uh, spending um, that the government issues um, to get, the, get America ready for fighting uh, this global war. So mo war mobilization, um, really triggers a uh, few social changes in America in terms of expanding um, the citizenship of women um, and both women and racial minorities. We'll talk about women for first uh, uh, to, to, to start this off. So with more than 15 million men in the armed forces, 
um, women in 1944 made up more than uh, one third of civilian labor force and 350,000 women served in auxiliary military units. So and the war mobilization really expanded the roles of women and the gender roles of women. Um, women that, that um, performed and, and worked in auxiliary military units um, got equal pay and equal rank as men, which is unheard of before. Also, the labor shortage really um, gave women a role in the economy that they never had before. Um, and this role uh, in this particularly military manufacturing is really illustrated through the trope and character of Rosie the River. Many of you um, probably are aware of this person. So by 1944, um, nearly 40% 40, 40 of all women were working, and that, that, that contributes to 19.4 million. As with, as with women, the wartime boom produced huge opportunities also for Black and Latino Americans as well. And this is really embodied you know, directly after America's involvement with World War I, its, its initial uh, declaration of war on the Axis powers. Uh, the Fair Employment Practices Commission is established, essentially creating black wages, uh, increasing black wages from an average of, um, you know, 65%, right? So, um, so it really increases black wages, but also expanded, expands the role of um, black and Latino people um, in the American economy, but also in the um, U.S. military. Now, keep in mind that the U.S. military uh, was still a Jim Crow institution, really impacted by Jim Crow, uh, political establishments um, throughout World War II. Um, it really wasn't after, it wasn't, wasn't until after World War II um, under um, President Truman that Blacks and Latinos, uh, the, their military units were essentially integrated, right, in 1948 with the Executive Order 9981. Um, but up until that point, um, Black, there, there are all black military units, like, like for example, the, the, rough, the um, Buffalo Soldiers, uh, the Harlem Hellfighters, same thing with Latino um, units as well. Um, Native Americans also playing a key role um, in this war effort. So when World War II began, the Air Force and the Marines, two vital branches of the U.S. military, had no black members, okay, completely segregated. The Army restricted the number of black enlistees and contained only five black officers. The Army had only five black officers in 1941. Um, most non-white military servicemen were largely confined to um, labor roles, including um, roles of constructing uh, buildings, transporting supplies, and other non-combat tasks. So non-white people were restricted from actually being on the front lines in many ways. By 1942, the U.S. Navy permitted black non-commissioned officers for the first time. Right? So we see this slow integration of the U.S. military, um, which is culminating in 1948, which is a much different context than the US, U.S.'s involvement in World War II, but nonetheless uh, represents a full integration of the U.S. military. So I want to stop here just for a moment um, to set up the next few slides, uh, next few lectures by suggesting that, um, well, many scholars have suggested that uh, the birth of the civil rights really begins, the civil rights movement really begins in World War II. Um, as this push for integrating US, US military forces. Um, and so this is, this is, this is uh, really evidence in this, what, what was called the, the, the double V campaign. So the double V campaign was a, um, a protest organized primarily by black um, labor organizers, you know, organizers that are, are arguing and protesting for fair labor employment, but nonetheless for racial, um, ra ra a racialized system of labor. So the war years that were during World War II um, was really the birth of the modern civil rights movement in many ways. So angered by the almost complete exclusion of black people from jobs in the rapidly expanding war industries, um, black labor leaders like A. Philip Randolph, who we'll talk about um, in the next few weeks, I think two weeks from then, um, as early as 1941, called for a, march, a series of marches on Washington demanding um, 
uh, access to defense employment, and also an end to segregation in the military. Um, but also, in addition to that, continuing a national anti-lynching uh, campaign for, uh, to, to end lynching in the South as well as in the North. So this Double V campaign um, was this, this labor organizing campaign along racial lines in which the protesters um, said that a victory over Germany and Italy um, and Japan necessitated a victory uh, over segregation at home. So a victory abroad uh, was really implicated um, and relied on a victory at home, meaning a victory over Jim Crow and a victory over segregation at home. So the, the Double V campaign became this platform for, um, for civil rights protesters throughout the 1950s, 1960s, right? Um, and so labor leaders like A. Philip Randolph, among others, um, really you know, became prominent through the WV campaign and later on pursued uh, that activism um, in other means that we see through the modern civil rights movement. So in this way, the World War II became pivotal for uh, the civil rights movement in America in the 1950s, 1960s. So we won't be talking too much about the military aspects of World War II. Um, like I said in the beginning, we're mostly focusing on the transformation of citizenship in this way, which is kind of like a reoccurring theme that we have throughout this class. So we'll, we'll skip really over to um, the diplomatic implications of World War II. So um, this is really, uh, really key in talking about the end of World War II with the Yalta Conference. And the Yalta Conference really establishes this global uh, world order, new world order, um, in which um, the world after, uh, after, after World War II is really divided between two spheres, okay? The sphere in the West, comprising mostly the democratic countries, uh, for example, um, Great Britain, the United States, among others, um, but they're the leaders, Great Britain, the United States, democratic, the Western democratic countries, also capitalistic countries. And, and the countries mostly in the East, mostly aligned with communist uh, Soviet Russia, right? Um, so the Yalta Conference is this conference of representatives of these major um, leading powers in the world. Um, and the conference is to dispute spheres of influence and to negotiate spheres of influence um, after World War II. Essentially, uh, these people got together, Churchill, Stalin, and um, Roosevelt, uh, to decide what the world will look like um, after World War II. Um, and essentially it established this, this uh, bipolar system um, in which the two opposing sides, those uh, aligned with Soviet Russia and those aligned with capitalist and democratic countries um, are really going to divide the world in two, okay? So Stalin's goals were essentially to gain Western acceptance of the Soviet sphere on, on the East, Eastern Europe and, and also to establish the dominance of the Western spheres influence in Western Germany as well. Another thing that's important about the Yalta Conference is that the United Nations um, really is founded out of this conference of various representatives. Okay, so the United Nations, like the League of Nations, right, um, the main goal of this, this organization of representative, international representative form of government um, is to maintain global peace, right? So if the League of Nations was put in place to essentially decide the, to, to confirm that another World War I would never happen, um, that's the same mission with, with the United Nations and to maintain global peace through international cooperation based on um, human rights, education, health, and trade. Okay, so this is another international um, form of government that is supposed to mitigate um, international conflict based on those criteria. By May 1945, only months after the Yalta Conference took place, Germany surrenders unconditionally, right? Um, but it isn't until later that year that Japan surrenders. Um, and Japanese surrender is really predicated on the development and implementation of nuclear weapons for the first time in world history, human history. 
So throughout World War II, um, there were a number of countries um, experimenting with nuclear power or attempting to create nuclear power by literally splitting an ab atom, right? And that's how nuclear power is generated by nuclear fission, by splitting an atom, um, which is releasing uh, uh, a huge amount of energy, right? And that's how, how nuclear power works, right? So um, it's mostly taking place, these scientists are experimenting with nuclear fission in Soviet Russia, uh, so Nazi Germany, um, America has its own nuclear physicists as well, and they're all trying to develop nuclear weapons, um, which um, with which they, with these these countries are attempting to end World War II. Once Germany surrenders, however, um, and by the way, they have the, the leading nuclear physicists in the world at this time. They're really at the forefront of development of nuclear power. Um, the German physicists are separated, and, and um, some of them go to the United States. Um, some of them go to Soviet Russia, and they're divided in this way. Um, and in either of those countries, they have their own missions to develop nuclear power. Um, and in, in some ways, they, you, can, you can think about this um, as you know, revolutionizing American uh, science, right? And, and science um, as it relates to um, military power. Already in the United States, we have a number of uh, German immigrants that um, had come to America in the 1930s, namely Albert Einstein, um, but also, um, uh, uh, I think he's Czech, or no, he's Hungarian, Hungarian Edward Teller. Um, and these two individuals are featured in the bottom right of this, this slide. Um, these are the really leading nuclear physicists. Above the, that, 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 that image, however, another leading, uh, um, phys physician, uh, physicist at this time, J. Robert Oppenheimer, um, really are testing and, and controlling, um, conducting controlled experiments and chain reactions involving the uh, involving uranium, plutonium, and the creation of atom bomb. This is known as the Manhattan Project. So the Manhattan Project is really this series of experiments in which American physicists are um, trying to develop nuclear power, and they ultimately do, right? Um, the first nuclear bomb is dropped in 1945 in, in New Mexico, in rural New Mexico. Um, and as soon as that happens, these physicists realize, uh, uh, realize that, you know, that what they have done is created this um, immense power that can be used in good ways or it can be used in bad ways. And it's really interesting. Um, their reflections um, after this this first this first nuclear bomb explosion. Um, J. Robert Oppenheimer, who um, you know was a big proponent and um, deeply spiritual person, um, in his journals um, transcribes part of the Bhagavad Gita, um, which is an Eastern spiritual text. Um, one quote from that he, he inscribes in his journals on realizing the amount, immense amount of power he's generated through nuclear vision. He says, I have become Vishnu, the creator of death, you know, and he realizes that, wow, I, you know, men, uh, humans um, through nuclear power have, have uh, gained the power, literally harnessed the power of the sun, right? Um, and can use this power literally to ev eviscerate, eviscerate um, human societies and literally evaporate human bodies from the earth. Um, and these leading scientists later on um, become uh, activists against the proliferation of nuclear weapons in this way. But at this moment, it's really intrinsic and very important for um, developing nuclear power um, to use to end World War II. So the military harnesses this nuclear power and develops nuclear bombs. Um, and ultimately drops a series of nuclear bombs on uh, Japan as a, as a way of kind of crippling their economy, first of all, but also um, in forcing Japanese to surrender. So on August, August 6, 1945, American planes dropped their first atom bomb um, on the Japanese in a place called Hiroshima. Um, immediately, 100,000 Japanese were instantly evaporated. Now, it's hard to wrap your mind around this, but literally what happens is that um, this chain reaction of, of, of nuclear power uh, really separates the atoms of the human body, and what's left is, is you know, just, uh, it, it literally melts human bodies, right? Um, but that's just one thing. So it's the initial um, explosion 
literally evaporates people, right? But really what happens is the afterlife of this nuclear explosion, which lasts, you know, more than a century, also the radiation over time kills, uh, you know, an exponential amount um, of people as well. So the first nuclear bomb does not uh, force the Japanese surrender. It isn't until the second nuclear bomb, three days later, Nagasaki killing instantly, again, evaporating 60,000 Japanese people, which ultimately forces the Japanese surrender uh, in 1945. The origins of the Cold War um, are really sewn into the end of World War II. So the United States emerges from World War II as by far the world's uh, greatest military and economic power in the world, right? Although most of the army is quickly demobilized, the American army is quickly demobilized after World War II, the country boasts the world's most powerful Navy and Air Force in particular. The United States also accounted for half of the world's manufacturing capacity um, and it alone, the United States alone was the only country to possess the atomic power. The only power that in any way could rival the United States was the Soviet Union, whose armies now occupied Eastern Europe, including parts of uh, Germany as well. So what happens immediately after World War II is this competition um, between two, this bipolar um, world paradigm, right, between the West, Western democratic countries and the Soviet-aligned um, Eastern uh, countries, in which the United States and its allies compete with the USSR um, and its allies for political and economic dominance around the world. And this is what's known as the Cold War. Um, and this rivalry, rivalry between the United States and Soviet Russia shaped almost every aspect of international politics, as well as domestic concerns. Um, from 1945 all the way into the early 1990s when the Soviet Union ultimately collapses. Um, so this is a huge paradigm shift in terms of world politics and American foreign policy. Um, and it really takes root in what's known as the Truman Doctrine. So the Truman Doctrine is this speech that Truman gives um, in which he uh, uh, sets up US foreign policy initiatives by um, everything that the United States does in terms of foreign policy between 1945 and the early 1990s was, in a way, checking the expansion of the influence of communist nations by aligning and, and creating uh, strategic military alliances and support of countries who are undecided between these two global spheres, right, the East and the West. Were these countries going to be you know, align with the communists or are they going to be democratic countries? And this becomes the Truman Doctrine, essentially checking the expansion of communist Russia in these ways. Um, and what happens throughout the rest of the 20th century are there's a series of proxy wars. You know, we, we, we call it the Cold War because there's no direct military conflict between the United States and Russia during this time, but rather there is a series of proxy wars in which um, we are supporting countries that are aligning themselves with either um, we're, we're supporting countries that align themselves with, with democratic countries um, and going to war with countries that align themselves with Soviets. So in proxy wars include uh, a Korean War, uh, mostly we're going to be focusing on the Vietnam War in the coming lectures, um, but the Cold War is anything but cold. In fact, it's very intense um, and heated, and there is direct military conflict between these two global players, the Western frontier, the Western hemisphere of the world and, and democratic countries, uh, and the Soviet-aligned countries as well. So this really sets up a lot of the content that we'll be covering uh, for the rest of the semester in this way. The Truman Doctrine, for these reasons, are very, very important for understanding the late 20th century American history. So this last slide really illustrates this bipolar um, world paradigm that emerges after World War II, um, in which a number of hotspots emerge throughout the world in which um, these two opposing sides are really competing for dominance in, in various aspects, uh, in various spheres of, of the globe during this time. Um, and we're gonna end it here for now because this is gonna get into another lecture we're gonna have about the domestic impact of the, of the Cold War in terms of um, how society transforms citizenship um, as a way of competing with Soviet Russia um, in this way. Um, and so over the, over the course of the next semester, of this semester, we'll be talking about some of those implications as it relates to 
uh, domestic policy, um, but also social and cultural changes in America as well. But as you review for the final exam, um, I want you to go back over the slide, especially the one before this, um, and focusing on how this um, relationship is established between these bipolar um, uh, global paradigms, uh, this, bi this bipolar system of, of um, international competition between the Soviet Union and the United States. Um, and I think it's particularly interesting how this develops um, in Germany, which, in which Berlin is literally split in half on the, on the western side and the eastern side, uh, really um, demarking this influence between the west and the east and the eastern influences. But it's important to know that this is also a global, a global paradigm in which um, both sides, both the United States and Soviet Russia, are competing for uh, different colonies, essentially, with, with what they are throughout the world, in South America, in, um, in Africa, and in Indonesia as well. Um, and it's important to know that, you know, these individual countries uh, also um, are, do realize uh, the situation which they're in. So oftentimes, um, these countries will play one side off of another, right, in terms of enhancing their own interests. But we'll talk more about those global implications of this Cold War paradigm um, in subsequent lectures, okay?